different now Now that my heart's been found Nothing really feels the same I hold my head a bit higher Lift my voice a bit louder Something inside has changed I am a mountain mover Water walker More than just an overcomer Cause I've been set free I am a gospel preacher Heart on fire Freedom singing Testifier Cause I've been All this time. How many are believers out there? Bible toting, testifying, gospel preaching, devil destroying, tongue talking, world overcoming believers out there. Hallelujah. Uh, glory to God. Amen. How many can we get shouting glory to God? <clears throat> I'll have to see your little things, but I can't hear you. So I got to see your little glory to God icon or whatever you're using out there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Word of faith speaking. Amen. Hallelujah. Positive confession making. Hand laying on. Amen. Getting folk healed. Glory to God. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, we're glad to have you with us this morning. And um, we are excited because we do uh, anticipate this is our last Sunday morning virtual service. 
uh, going back in person next Sunday, uh, unless there's some type of um, uh, whatever, we should be closing Friday and moving in and having our first service on Sunday. Glory to God. Looking forward to that. Uh, just a heads up. Our plan is, um, because this is a fifth Sunday next Sunday, and we want to do a celebratory move-in Sunday, fifth Sunday fellowship potluck dinner after church. Hallelujah. So bring your, go ahead and plan on getting your favorite dish ready. Um, closing is Friday. Um, like I said, unless some, the only thing we don't have is the insurance information has not been sent to the, the lender yet. Uh, that's what we're waiting on. I talked to them on Friday. They were supposed to do it on Friday. We anticipate tomorrow. But, um, you know, unless there's some weird snaf snafu, uh, we are, we're closing Friday and moving in and planning. So we want you to bring uh, your favorite dish. Now, Belinda must bring, I understand, uh, chocolate eclair things, whatever they are. And um, the taco ring would work, but we got to have the chocolate eclair, Belinda. Now, that was a request from somebody when they heard what we were doing. So <clears throat> no pressure, none whatsoever. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But um, we are looking forward to next week. Glory to God. So uh, Tuesday night uh, will continue being Zoom prayer meetings. Um, but Wednesday night we will be back live in person. Um, just a heads up, next Sunday may not be able to be streamed because we can't get... Um, um, spectrum out until Monday. Try to do it before then, but can't come until Monday. And so the internet won't be running. So we don't know what the situation will be. Uh, we, we may give it a shot, but if it doesn't work, just understand um, you'd have to, if you can't make it next Sunday, you'd have to watch it later on a delay uh, because, um, and after that we'll be fine, but we don't have um, uh, internet coming in until Monday week. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many can say God is good? Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, so much going on. So many things we're going to be sharing with you um, as we move into this new phase and uh, of ministry and of purpose. Glory to God. And we're so excited <clears throat> to be carrying out the will of God. Hallelujah. And it's always good to walk out God's plan. And God's plan rarely looks like what you think it's supposed to look like. Hallelujah. Um, just, it's just, that's a rarity, you know, now you may think that you got it all, but I'm going to tell you, God has stuff that you just don't know about. And there are things that take place. I keep thinking about Paul when they were on the, him and, um, I believe Barnabas, Paul and Silas, Paul and Silas Paul, were on their way one place and the, they were forbidden by the spirit to go there. And that night he had a dream. And in that dream, I heard a man over. Uh, I believe in Macedonia, say, come over unto us. And he went over there. And what's the first thing that happened? They get whipped, beaten, put in jail. You know? Uh, well, over, over where Ephesus is. And um, so they got, they got um, yes, 1030 next Sunday. I'm sorry. Our, our church, church Sunday morning now is 1030. Glory to God. With anticipation within a year or so, having to have a 9 o'clock and a 1030 service. Praise God. Glory to God. We're going to, we're just going to believe God to, you know, to explode um, with the growth and reaching people and sharing the good news and touching lives and transforming them with the power of the gospel. Hallelujah. We're, we're very excited about that. Praise God. So um, those announcements are out of the way, I think. Um, any, any more y'all got you would think of? None? All righty. Glory. Um, we, we started out this year with a, a focus in this month. And um, oh, by, by the way, be planning on bringing people to church. Get sick people so we can lay hands on them. And, um, you know, get some demon-possessed folk and bring them. We'll cast the devil out of them. Hallelujah. Amen. But uh, we, we want to we wanna just share the power of God with people, the good news of Jesus Christ. Let them experience the, the glory and the power of of his goodness and ministering life to them in Jesus' name. Praise God. But we started out uh, with a focus on God, being committed to him, being submitted to him, um, having our dreams come from him. 
and so forth. And I want to talk about this morning, something you've heard before and share, but on establishing priorities. Um, because I do believe that if we will establish the proper priorities, a lot of the things we shared the past couple of three weeks uh, will fall into the right place. You won't be, um, I do know being, you know, going out classical Pentecostal, coming over into the word of faith, charismatic arena. Uh, one of the things that, that we could judge ourselves on, see ourselves on, that there are areas which we became self-centered and self-serving over and um, under the guise of one God wanting us blessed, which is true. God wants us to prosper, which is true. But he wasn't trying to set you up to be a regular on the lifestyles of the rich and famous. His purpose of prosperity is to advance the kingdom throughout the earth. Now, he wants you to be blessed in the process, but it's not a lasciviousness. Okay? Um, Paul even writes to talk about people who would, who would make themselves rich or would be rich. In other words, that's their whole focus. And they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so we have to, you know, we have to keep things in proper perspective. How do we do that? We establish the right priorities of life. Amen. You keep your priorities straight. Then as we walk out the word of God, we walk out the things of God, we do what God tells us to do. Things fall into the right place because your priorities are straight. So uh, let's go, if you will, to Luke, the 10th chapter, Luke, the 10th chapter. We'll be reading from the 40th through the 42nd verses. And everybody say, glory be to God forevermore. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody eyeball to eyeball. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's, um, <clears throat> we're, we're looking forward to that with great anticipation. We, we haven't seen you in person since the 20th of December or the 19th of December, whatever that Sunday was. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing you in person and live. Hallelujah. Glory. It says here, Mar Mar uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me alone to serve? Bid her therefore that she help me. I'm over here doing all this stuff. I'm cooking, I'm cleaning, I'm serving. And she's sitting over here in the back end doing nothing but sitting there listening to, to you preach. And Jesus said to her, <coughs> Martha, Martha, they are careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, <coughs> which shall not be taken away from her. Now, this gives us insight into the lives of two different people. Now, listen, both love the Lord. Martha loved Jesus. Mary loved Jesus. And they wanted to serve and please and honor him, yet in different ways. Um, the problem with Martha was she had misplaced priorities. Was it a priority to take care of the house guests and so forth and so on? Yes, but not at the expense of it coming before the Lord. Hello? So her priorities, though right, were misplaced in their position of, or order of when they should be carried out. Um, when an individual has misplaced priorities, they will make decisions based on the wrong information. In other words, when they elevate a priority into an improper place, it will take on a, um, a stronger voice and direction than the proper priority would in that place. And it will misdirect you into doing things at the expense of something that's more needful. Um, in Martha's case, she thought that uh, Jesus would be pleased with her serving when, in fact, Mary had chosen the good part. What we want to do is choose the good part for our lives. Then we'll make good decisions because that good part is based upon the word being first place in our lives. Okay. And um, 
So the priorities of life are, uh, now listen, these are not an annual, oh, it's a new year, let me get my priorities straight thing. These are lifetime commitments. This is, this is a lifestyle. Having proper priorities is a lifestyle, not a New Year's resolution that, you know, I'm going to lose weight and it's now February. I'm going to get there and it's now March. No, these have to be a lifetime commitment. Um, and if you don't do that, you won't make good decisions. You will allow an out-of-place priority to force you into the wrong decision. So, Let's talk about, um, I like the way Dr. Ken Stewart, uh, at the time, the uh, International Provost for Rainbow Bible uh, Training College back in uh, 1980 era, uh, back when I was at Rainbow, um, said, you, we talked about these, these things uh, and our commitment. He said, our commitments here are a lifetime, never turning back until Jesus returns commitment. Amen. Just like when I married my wife, it was a lifetime commitment. It wasn't until I didn't feel married. Now, I probably would have never made it to the divorce court because telling her I didn't feel married would have gotten a cast iron frying pan beside my head and probably would have been buried. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to ask her if that's right, honey, because you all know it is. Don't we, honey? Right. Yep, she said, that's right. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, our number one, are you ready? We're not going to go five, four, three, two, one. We're going to go one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So this is the opposite of family feud. Glory to God. The number one priority of life is God. You make a lifetime personal commitment, never turning back until Jesus comes. Lifetime commitment. Of course, then you go to heaven and then it's an eternal uh, commitment to God. Exodus 20 verses, we, we're not going to read the whole chapter. Okay. It's, it's, that's just way too much. Uh, but let's just read the first verse. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God. Uh, let me see if that was verse. Let's go. Exodus chapter one. I'm going to make sure I'm not telling you the wrong verse. So you go look and you go on. I can't find it. Ever ever happen to you? Preacher quote the wrong verse and you can't find it and you spend the rest of the service trying to figure out where he was. Exodus chapter 20. That's what I'm really off. <clears throat> Usually in my notes, I put, um, okay, it's Exodus, yeah, that's what happened. It's Exodus 21 and 2, an extra number got put in there. Again, happy fingers on the keyboard. Um, and God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, folks, in our day and age, gods aren't necessary. Well, they are in some places, but um, for many of us, the gods before God aren't little idols, little fat Buddhas sitting on your shelf or burning incense or getting in weird positions and ch chanting and emptying yourself out to nothingness or, you know, being a moony. Many times it's activities or other priorities we place before him. Priority, you know, rest can become our priority superseding God. What do you mean? Well, I work all weekend. I need to sleep on Sunday mornings. I can see where there'd be a case you've got to have, you know, you've overdone it and you need to get rest. But every week you can't come to church because I got to get rest. I'm, I'm just, I always have to have rest, you know. No. You've got to make God a priority. Amen. He, he restores you. Amen. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. That's what God said. 
Are you here? They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. Hallelujah. And so we have to keep God first. We can't use other things and allow them to get in front of God. Psalm 119 and 164 says, Seven times a day do I praise thee because thy righteous judgments. Amen. The 27th Psalm in verse 8 says, When thou saidst, it's hard to say in some of these King James words. How about this? When thou said, Seek my face, ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Praise the Lord. We need to be seekers of God. 63rd Psalm, verses 1 through 3, declare, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is to see thy power and thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. And so we, here we have the psalmist talking about seeking after God. As if you are you are in a, a dry land and thirsty, you know. You've seen the you've seen the movies where the guy or somebody's out in the desert and they've gone out into the desert or were dropped off in the desert, to, you know, and uh, or they're lost, whatever. They're out in the desert and they have no water and they're under the heat and they're struggling, you know. And then they get some water and they, I mean, just a drop of water is like you know um, a million dollars. And here the psalmist says that my, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. <clears throat> Soul thirsteth for thee. Glory to God. They that hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Glory to God. Can you say amen? Can y'all say, come on, give me some uh, happy thumbs ups out there. <clears throat> And so we need to, oh, okay. I got in person. I got the fam here. I got my, my built-in congregation in house. Praise God. But y'all out there online, glory to God. There to come. Amen. God has to be number one in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Matthew 22, 36 through 38. They asked Jesus, said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then after that, he said, And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But the first commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Amen. And Jesus said, this is the first and the great commandment. In other words, it is the most important commandment of all is to love God. Put him first. Because what you love, what your affections are on, what your heart is set to is what you will give all your effort to. When we look in the second chapter, um, or 21st chapter of John, in verse 15 through 17, we're at the um, Passover with Jesus. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Now, 
in Peter's case, obviously he was called to be uh, one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, um, to be minister in that light, in that sense. But what Jesus was saying is, carry out my will. Do my will. If you love me more than anything else, you'll do my will. Now, even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, Lord, Father, if there be any other way, let this cut pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Are you here? You gone home. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus didn't want, he, he did not want to go to the cross. He did not want to face the separation. He did not want to be saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He did not want to face that circumstance, but he said, not my will, thy will be done. What we've done in some cases with some of our teaching, particularly along the lines of, you know, you can have what you say and, you know, whatever you have by faith you can get and da 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 da, -da is whatever we want, whether God has a different plan or not, we get to have it because we've got faith. But Brother Wigglesworth um, used to say, and Brother Hagen, I mean, I'm sorry, Bosworth, F.F. Bosworth stated, and Brother Hagen picked it up, and he would say it a lot, um, was faith begins where the will of God begins. I mean, it's known, where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Just you coming up with an idea in your head and beginning to confess it and declare it because well, I got a scripture that says that what things forever that I desire, what I pray, believe that I receive, that I shall have it. Wait a second. Go back to verse 22 or 23. For verily I say unto that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. You can try to convince yourself you believe you've got it, but if it's not the will of God, you can't have faith. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, I'm trying to think of the passage in 1 John. Um, it says, it says um, if we know he heareth us, we know we have the desire, the, the petitions we desire of him. Uh, let me, let me that's not my notes, but I'll grab it anyway, if y'all don't mind hanging on here. Grab a hold of your seats. We don't have to be all theatrical. Wait for it. Wait for it. You know, here it comes. This, this revelation that you've never heard before. There's no private interpretation. Y'all hear? Um, I love looking for this. I always forget where I put it. Huh? What? The one that says, um, we know we have the petitions we desired of him. I always think it's in chapter two. I always keep thinking it's in chapter two. Um, Verse 13 of 1 John chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, it didn't say anything. That's like the people who go around confessing, I can do all things. I can do all things. I can do all things. That's not what the Bible says. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It says I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The minute you leave off through Christ, which strengtheneth me, you've misquoted the scripture. <clears throat> you can, because the power of positive thinking and not the power of a God in power or God infused life. Here, faith does not work 
that you get, you know, I know Brother Hagin wrote the book, You Can Have What You Say, but that's the title of a mini book that has a principle in it, but he covers these other things there. It's not just left out that you can just go ahead and believe for anything you want. You can't believe for somebody else's wife. That's against the God, will of God. And I know people who've done it. Or know of people who've done it. Say it that way. Well, the Bible says I can have what I say. I believe I receive so-and-so's wife. You can't do that. That's not faith. Actually, it's lust. And it's, it's against the will of God. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I want some enthusiasm out there, guys. I need a, I need a preach, Pastor. All right. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, what's the opposite of that? If it's not according to his will, he doesn't hear it. Verse 15. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions we desired of him. So here it comes back to keeping God as your number one priority in life. If you're going to be able to live by faith, having God as your number one priority, his, you know, that means you, you, his word, his will, the, the things he's declared supersede any whim you have. Does that make sense? You know, there are a lot of people go, well, I want such and such. Well, I, be I believe it's, I, I believe I receive it in Jesus' name. Did you go to the scripture? Did you, did you go before God? And now I have learned There are times we start down directions and God's telling us that's the wrong direction, but because we got our confession out there, we keep pursuing, hello, we keep pursuing the wrong direction. And I can tell you, you pursue it long enough and God will let you do it. And then you'll go blaming for it when it falls apart. Can I get a grunt? Holy, uh, it's true. Too many people have gone after their wants, failing to submit it to God as the number one priority of their life. And I'm going to tell you why. They're afraid he'll say no. That's not the right way. And they really want it. Then what's the problem with that? You're trying to get God to bless your mess. And that's what Israel got. And look what happened. They got a king. And it was nothing but a mess afterwards. Even the greatness of David was a mess. Hello? Own son tried... Uh, 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 Killed somebody in the family. Absalom was 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 slain. Um, Bathsheba, I mean, you know, murder, conspiracy to commit murder, cover up. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. All because Israel wanted a king, and we, you know, we that we love the story and we love the redemption of of, through, of God uh, manifest through David, but um, Israel wanted a king instead of having God as their king. He told Samuel, uh, they've not rejected you. They rejected me. So let's make sure we don't establish kings of our will over God. When God, and I can tell you, God's plan's always better. God's plan is always better. Hello. Now, it's okay to start pursuing stuff, but as you let as you, you go before the Lord, you're leaving that out there before the Lord, and he starts saying something. Um, I've, I've seen people um, pray things out, but praying out of their soul instead of out of the spirit till it became so big in them, 
It took supernatural manifestation of God to change it. Because they pushed it so far in their own uh, will and shut off the stream of God speaking contrary to it that they they almost you know, made, made a huge, huge mistake. I've seen people do this. Let's keep God first. Let's seek the Lord. Let's submit our plans to him. If we have a plan, we, we're thinking something, submit it to him. Well, he didn't say anything. But that don't mean go ahead. Brother Buddy Harrison used to say, there's a sinking feeling right here on the floor. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, you say stuff and it's like the whole congregation. It just sunk because, you know, <clears throat> We're not preaching against faith. As a matter of fact, what I'm talking to you about is faith. Because if you ask anything according to his will, you know he hears you. It's those other areas where you don't, if it's an area you don't, now listen, you don't have to ask God when you pray about being healed. He's already put it in his word. By his stripes you were healed. He's already put in his word, the 103rd Psalm. Bless the Lord, all my soul, all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. I mean, that's, that's, that's in the word of God. You don't have to pray, is this my day of salvation? Harden not your heart as in the day of provocation. When they, <clears throat> when they, they didn't listen to him and, they, and, and uh, so forth. Amen? Because today is the day of salvation. In Hebrews chapter 10. Today is the day of salvation. Amen. So you don't need to pray, Lord, is this the day that you want me to be saved? No, that's already in the word. But there's areas of possessing things, of having things, of buying certain houses. Now, God, listen, God doesn't mind you having a house. But there are times that maybe you're wanting to buy a house and there'll be nothing wrong with you having it, but it's the wrong time or the wrong place because God's got something else in your plan in the future hello that that would not help facilitate and he knows that and so you say I love the house I want the house but then on the inside something's going no don't get that no I, but I can have what I say get behind me Satan in Jesus name I can tell you honey you could Jericho march all day long outside the will of God and it ain't going to work. You could throw buckets of anointing oil all over it and it ain't going to work. Can I get people standing? Now get up in your living room, put your church finger up and walk out for just a second and come right back. Because that's the truth. Can, can I get some... Uh, I need some I need some support out there, guys. Hallelujah. All right. So we know that we if he hears us, we what we are serving, we ask. We know we have the petitions we desired of him. Thank y'all. I love them hearts and amens and stuff that, that flew up there. Glory to God. So God says if you love him, you'll carry out his will. Amen. And there are going to be times you're going to have to submit to the will of God. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. My wife was a daddy's girl. Major daddy's girl. And moving to Greensboro, you may as well go on to Bangkok. <laughs> she didn't want to leave Greenville. But you know, this is where God's leading us. Yeah. And I see God already worked on that a little bit ahead of time because we almost ended up in Mexico City, Mexico as missionaries. And in order to do that, we were going to have to go to England for, for 10 weeks. And uh, that one was another pill. Yeah. I'm going to tell on her. She. <laughs> I'm getting myself in trouble. But she didn't want to fly over to England. 
for 10 weeks to go to the Pentecostal Holiness uh, World's Mission School. And, um, you know, we, we were, they, somebody just said the food's bad over there. It, it is kind of nasty. Um, hallelujah. Um, I didn't really eat a whole lot in England I liked. Um, well, anyway, that's a double story. They're trying to get me off track so I won't tell off on mommy. No, um, I'm not going to finish the sermon this morning. We'll have to finish it next Sunday or I don't know when we're going to finish it. We'll finish it because uh, next Sunday it might be a celebration service. I don't know what we're going to do, but we'll finish this either next or the week after we'll get, we'll get through the priorities. Um, so just kind of stay with us on that. I'm hung up on the first one. Um, but we were down in South Carolina at, um, um, a little town there across the border from, I, I forgot the name of the little Lake City or something, South Carolina. And there was a big conference headquarters for the PH Church of South Carolina, uh, about 5,000 people there. Um, and um, we, I even got to speak for a couple of minutes. I'm, I was going on this Mexico City team. Uh, and, you know, I was young and I, w I wasn't in full-time ministry. I was so excited. I was going, I'm going to get going ministry full-time and um, this is like 1979, 1980, 81, 81 ish, 82, 81, 82, right there. Um, and we, we, we were talking with the world, the head of world missions saying, we're, we're ready to go. We're committed to go. We just don't want to have to go to England. And he looks at us and says, you have to go to England. And man, I said, well, let's go talk. So my, my Janie and I walked off to a corner by ourselves. And um, boy, she didn't want to go. I'm telling you, she did not want to go. She didn't want to fly the pond. She didn't want to be away from home for 10 weeks. Uh, there was nothing exciting about it to her at all. And sitting there with tears in her eyes, she said, okay, I'll go. Balling. So I'm like, yes, <laughs> but I didn't do that in front of her. <laughs> I was a good, compassionate husband. It's going to be fine, honey. It's going to be fine. And so um, um, I'll go back over. We go back over to, um, I, I forget, uh, Uriel something. I forgot his last name. Um, <clears throat> he was the head of the world missions of the Pentecostal Holiness Church at the time. And I said, we'll go to England. He said, good. So we came back, you know, from that meeting, came back home. Uh, we're going to start raising money to go, you know, because um, we got to raise money to go to England. You know, we got to have money. We got to pay. We got as a missionary, you got to pay for everything, yeah. and they don't pay for anything. You got to pay for it all, and um, we start raising money, you know. And, and we've been praying, you know. We, you know, we feel like the Lord has been leading us this way, and we're committed to it. So we've committed. She's committed, and um, and then about oh, two weeks later, I'm in prayer about this, and the Lord said. I didn't want you to go. I just wanted you to be willing to go. And I said, what? Yeah. I just wanted you to be willing to go. So I called my pastor up and I said, I called him, we got to come talk to you. And so we drive over the house that night, right then. I said, I'm praying. And I, I believe the Lord just told me that I don't want you to go to, Eng uh, to Mexico City. I just wanted you to be willing to go. And part of that was my wife. She had to be willing to go. Because uh, we got to go, it's got to be a team. I just can't take off a go without her. Um, you know, you don't do that. That's craziness. And um, the pastor looked at me and said, My wife's been screaming for weeks. He's not supposed to go. He's not supposed to go. They're not supposed to go. I said, Well, Pastor, you tell me not to go and we won't go. He said, Don't go. And that was the end of it. But the, we got there. We committed to what we thought was the will of God, submitted to it, because he had to find out our willingness to do what he said to do. Now that's a, that's a, maybe a little bit different than just you know always following the will of God straight up. But here's a case where we were willing to go do this, and he said, "I just wanted you to be willing." Then um, it wasn't nine months later that this um, this opportunity to move to Greensboro came, and um, we and, and I already had a vision in advance that I was supposed to come to Greensboro. God spoke to me supernaturally. And so uh, after a few months, uh, uh, my pastor and Buddy Harrison 
uh, who I was ordained with the Faith Christian Fellowship at the time, uh, said, what are you going to do about Greensboro? I said, well, we're sp I've known for months I'm supposed to take it, take this church. And um, I was just walking it out. And um, that's how we ended up in Greensboro. But although my wife didn't want to leave Greenville and leave her daddy, it was a conciliatory that it wasn't England and Mexico. It was only a three-hour drive instead of a three-hour flight back into the country to get home. Hello? So God knew what he was doing, and we just kept saying, yes, Lord, to the what we believe was the will of God. And God called us here, and God established us here. And we've been here all these years. And um, there, there are places we believe that we are, that we were supposed to, uh, you know, had done and gotten to a certain size yet in a certain place. And that hasn't all worked out. But now we're seeing the twist and the turns of just staying faithful to the will of God. My heart, there were times in the past decades that I could have packed up and left overnight put the house on the market and sold it after I got wherever I was going because of stuff that you went through. But the side of me that said, I must do the will of God. And the side of me that said, I had to be faithful to God's will, not my want, not what I think will be best for me personally, but what is God's will kept me here. And now we're about, we're walking into something that um, I think is just the beginning of an explosive era in the ministry and the church of, 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 of the power and the glory of God and the transformation of the hearts of men and women and by the masses. Glory to God. Because we value putting God first over our own personal will first. Now I can say this. The psalmist, or not the psalmist, but in the, in the Old Testament it says this. Swear to your own hurt and change not. There will be times when you are putting God first. It looks like you've sworn to your own hurt. And the easiest thing to do is to pack it in and quit. When in reality, the worst thing you can ever do is quit being faithful and quit walking in obedience and quit doing what God said. Because... Do not grow weary for in due season. Now, some people, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Look at somebody else and say, well, they've only been doing it for two years and look at them. I've been doing it for 25 and look at me. Maybe their due season was two years. God says, do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. Not fainting, not becoming weary in well-doing, not becoming weary in keeping God put first, his will, his desires, his purposes, his plans over anything else. you will reap in due season. I can't tell you when your due season is. And you won't know until due season shows up. Okay? Well, praise the Lord. You, you will reap if you don't get weary, okay? So just rejoice, just be blessed, and put God first in your life. And in everything you do, glory to God. Can you say amen? Um, let's move on. After you put God first, next comes your spouse. Your lifetime never changing until Jesus comes back. Commitment to your spouse. Nothing goes in that slot. 
If you're unmarried, it stays empty. Why? Because when you do get married, something else can't come before that. Well, I play golf on Sundays or, or Wednesday or I mean on Saturday mornings. You get married and your wife doesn't want to play golf on Saturday morning. Um, you got a problem. Well, I'm just going to tell you, that's the way it is. I play golf on Saturdays. No. When you commit to a marriage and you commit to your wife and you commit or husband, they come before your activities. Thank you for your enthusiasm. But it's the truth. Now, I don't know how many golf players we have. Well, I know I know Jerry likes to play golf, but I could I could tell you, um, Jerry Jerry doesn't go out and play golf every time he he, he, get, he's, he gets a chance. I don't ride by the the uh, Jamestown Golf Course over here on East Fort Road uh, every afternoon to see Jerry out there. Okay, um, it, it just don't work that way. Genesis two eighteen says, "And the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help a help meet for him." And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought, un, brought them unto Adam to see that he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord calls, God calls a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took up his ribs and closed up his flesh and stepped thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And he brought her unto the man. And the man, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Why? They were covered in the glory of God. It wasn't until the glory went out that you could see their nakedness. So all these people who go around and say, we're like Adam and Eve in the garden. No, you're not because you're not covered in the glory. And some of you need to be covered in something. I can tell you. Um, no, they were, they were, they were naked as far as the flesh, not having clothing on it, <clears throat> but there was a covering of the glory of God. Okay. Hallelujah. Um, Ephesians 5 25 says, husbands love your wives as the uh, uh, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Matthew 19, 3, um, the Pharisees came to him and say, and him and saying, is it lawful for a man to put his wife for every sin or every cause? And he answered and said unto them, have you not read, uh, that he made them at the beginning, male and female. And he said, for this cause <clears throat> shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And they said, then why did Moses give us a writing of divorcement and put her to put her away? And he said to him, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you or allowed you to put away your wife. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put his wife, except it be for fornication and shall be married, uh, marry another committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And so your spouse takes the second, role of priority in your life. And why is that? God had a family before he had a church. Churches are made up of family units. Now I know we have singles and this kind of thing and so forth. And, and people are, we, listen, there's a lot of divorce. <coughs> there's a lot of single parent families. Um, there's a lot of situations that are difficult, but God's ultimate plan is a father, a mother, the children, and a family unit, hallelujah, is the, is the core of the church. It is the it is um, allegorical. It is um, 
functioning in, 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 the, in this world. It's the way God designed it. So you cannot have a solid family unit without a solid relationship between the husband and the wife. And I mean male and female born biologically. No, no, no messing around with this, this stuff for the world. Male and female, period. Okay? That is the only thing God recognizes. Period. He doesn't recognize anything else. So, God wants family units. God wants that. So, what happens if I'm not married? Then you leave that space for a spouse to come in. You're a single mother with, with children. You leave a space for the spouse to come in and that establish a relationship in front of those children of a man and woman who love God, who love each other, and, and, and create a family unit that they can model when they grow up and go into the world. Okay? Maybe there's been a divorce, and, and that's, that's tragic. And the children saw the, the difficulties of the divorce. But in your reconciliation, in your restoration, trust that God will bring you the spouse in restoring you and your family unit so that the modeling before your children and your family can be that of a godly one. Okay? God hates divorce because of the destruction it causes. It's very destructive. And God wants good, loving family. So you have to leave that spouse slot empty if you're not married. If you are married, don't prioritize things over your spouse. Don't put your children above your spouse. That one ever big. I see it all the time. You see it in the world. You see it around. Families, people that will put their kids above their spouse. And you can't do that. We got to give them the world. You know what? You can't give them the world. Amen. And if you are so busy giving your children the world that you don't have time for your spouse... You have misplaced priorities. Come on. Can I get a witness from the church? Amen. I said, can I get a witness from the church? Amen. Jesse. Amen. Thank you. Because, let me say this. If your kid missed a soccer game of um, bumblebee ball at three years old, it will not affect them nearly as much as having a, rela a, a bad relationship between mom and dad in the house. Thank you. Y'all know what I mean? You ever watch the little kids play soccer? I mean, the ball goes, and the whole, both teams, they're just like little, you know, bees following that ball all over the field. And um, you usually have one kid that some parent has coached them and, um, you know, like on, on steroids. And, you know, they're the superstar soccer player because they're, they, they've, they've trained since they could walk, you know, and their life is going to a soccer game. You've got to have a marriage. You've got to be a good example. You have to have a strong mom, a parent, <clears throat> the relationship in the house <clears throat> as a family um, in order to be a witness and to train up your children like they should be trained up. Glory to God. So your number two priority is your spouse. They don't come before God. Hello. Now, women, you can't be at every church meeting on the planet eight days a week while your husband's working. He comes home, he's tired. Well, there's a revival over such and such church. There's a revival over such and such church. Well, they're having church over here. I'm, and you're going to every service and leaving him home. You can't do that. That's not putting God first. That's putting your marriage over 
I mean, it's between church over your marriage. Church doesn't come there. Church is really your fourth priority. God was first. Your spouse next. Third is your children. You're to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Hello. Um, children are told to obey their parents because it's well unto the Lord. It's the first commandment with promise that they may be well with thee, that they may live long on the earth. Um, God said of Abraham, I know he'll command his children after him. Your children come after your spouse, not before, but then they are a priority of life. Now, let me say this. You, we, I, grew up, I grew up in a denominational classical Pentecostal church, and in that, it was almost a sin to miss church ever for something for your children. You just did well, we just don't we, we don't miss church. That's great, you don't miss church. But you know what? There's gonna be times there are events that go on in your children's life. We're in the state playoffs of high school baseball, and we, we're playing on Wednesday night. We are not missing church. We don't miss church because we don't miss church. You're putting ball before God. And you can't do that. They have to have a balance. Okay? Now, I understand not having you know, your kids play year-round on every Wednesday night, so they're always out of church or every, every weekend uh, on club ball, missing church every week. Well, we have, we have chapel. No. Uh, I get that, but you're gonna have events like, um, you know, maybe maybe the state playoffs this weekend, and they start on Friday and they end on Sunday, and then you you know, this might be a once in a lifetime event. Well, you don't deny your kids that, so your kids are the next priority. You keep them in church, and that's part of your your husband wife parenting thing, <clears throat> but it, it just be, bring a balance, and don't become obsessed. Um, to the point that it, um, that it, you know, Robert, you want to make, you have good example with your kids and you don't want them to, um, hate church because they couldn't do anything else in life. You don't have to do that. You can balance it properly where church is a priority that you go to church regularly and almost all the time. But if an event comes up, um, there may have to be an adjustment for this event. All right? We're to train them in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart. We're not to provoke them to anger. All right? Let's, let's, so let's make sure we keep our kids, you know, God, your priority first is God. Second is going to be your spouse. Third is going to be, then your children. You have to invest in your children. You have to invest time. You have to invest um, uh, faith. You have to invest energy. But it's not going to be something that happens without your investment. Okay? After your kids comes church. Now, I mean, church is a priority. So, you, you know, you have to, you can't let the church, you can't abdicate your responsibility, hello, and priority of your children and leave it to the Sunday school teacher at church. The church is a supplement to godly leadership in the home. Hello. You're keeping God first, your spouse, your children, and then church is a fourth priority of life. God had a family before he had a church. Now, you may, you may see it differently, and that's okay, and you may be able to say, well, if you have church second behind God, then these other things, I, I, I can, I can, I, we could argue that either way, and we, you know, we could probably make points either way. But I just, I just, I just think if we, if we understand the commitments to our God, commitments to our spouse, commitment to our children, and then we bring that into the church, we have stronger churches, and we glean more from the church, and then church becomes a part of that priority listing and enabling us to fulfill our priorities of life. Um, Jesus said, Mark 16, 18, Thou say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, Petros, not Petra, but Petros, and upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Peter being a stone, the rock being like the rock of Gibraltar, 
Uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if you read the preceding verse, you find out <coughs> that the, the Petra was revelation knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, that it was revealed not by flesh and blood, but by the spirit. On the rock of revelation, Peter was not the rock. Peter was a stone. Peter was not made to be the first pope. Peter was a stone. The revelation knowledge was the rock. Petros and Petra. Two different Greek words, one meaning a pebble. Actually stony. Peter was stony. Okay? But the rock of revelation, he will build his church. Amen. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. Um. And we have, we have tons of scriptures on the church. But, you know, the Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. We need to come together where iron sharpens iron, where the shepherd of the sheep are there to feed the sheep. The community that, we, that is created is strength. Amen. It becomes our own company. And they went into their own company after they were beaten and let go and said, and, and reported to all the chief priests and elders, I mean, and reported all the things that the chief priests and elders had done unto them. And they began to pray. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Stretch forth thine hand to heal by the, in the name of thy holy child, Jesus, and the place was shaken. <clears throat> Glory to God. The value of the church in our priority of life. It has to be a priority. Amen. Well, I get church. I, I do church at home. Watch out for that. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some. Hello. I've heard people come up. We, we get... We come up with doozies. I hear do they're just doozies. And you just, you know, I know um I, I know situations where people are say, Well, I'm the I'm the husband, I'm the pastor of the house. That's stretching scripture. There is no biblical foundation for that. Um, you know, so we don't go to church, I'm the pastor. Well then who's your pastor? You're the pastor of the house. Who's your pastor? Pastors need pastors. I have a pastor. And I have other men of God that speak into my life. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not here on by myself. I'm not out there so far that I don't need anybody. So we have to be careful about that. No, we need, we need one. Your children, your wife needs fellowship with other women. You know, I mean, the fellowship of the brethren and, and, the, and the sisters in the church are important one to each one. We, we minister, we, we, we gain, um, there is ministry that takes place body, uh, every joint supplying glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, so it's important. Remember, you know, he wrote in Ephesians chapter four, um, that, you know, the body of Christ. And then we come together as, as a local body and we join together and every joint supplieth unto the edifying of itself in love. We need, so that has to be a priority of life. It can't be a non-priority. Yeah, I need rest. God will restore you when you make getting into church a priority. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm kind of cutting these a little bit shorter, but I, want, I do want to finish today because next week we're going to go in a different direction. And then um, your next one is your job. That was a joke. It's your job. I was just messing around. Um, fifth priority of life is your job, your employment. Um, Proverbs 18, 9 says, He that is slothful in his work is brother to him 
that is a great waster. Proverbs 22, 29, seeing, seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Amen. And then Bob, Bob talks about um, the, the, the skin doesn't prosper. Uh, the soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. See? So employment and working, the hand of the diligent prospering. You have to have, um, as a, as a um, priority of life, your job has to be a priority. Well, you know, I, I got a job, but we all want to just, just go out tonight and go eat and, um, you know, I don't know, um, go ride around for three hours instead of going to work. I'm just not going to go to work. Your job's not a priority. Now, uh, sometimes people get to a place where with car payments and house payments and stuff, um, out of necessity, their job becomes a priority. Um, but, um, you can't just forego your responsibility of work because you don't feel like it today. Hello. Now I know the past couple of years with all the uh, craziness that went on in the country, they were paying people to stay home. People were getting money for not being employed. They, they were quitting jobs. Uh, we were, we went to a restaurant. We have a restaurant we go to, um, fairly regularly and they had two, uh, employees that were college students who quit because their COVID money came in by, for being college students. Now, I don't know what they're going to do when the COVID money runs out. Maybe want to come back to work. And I would dare say that place probably won't hire them. And I wouldn't either because they weren't, they didn't have it as a priority. It wasn't a priority. You know, money was a priority working. It wasn't. So, when we keep God first, so, so your job can't come before God. It can't come before church. Like well, Brother Hagin used to tell the story about um, uh, a uh, man that was in his church, and uh, he came and said, "Well, Brother Hagin, I'm leaving. I'm I'm taking a job over in, uh, in another city, some so many numbers of miles away that was so far that he wouldn't be able to come to that church anymore." And he, he said, "Well, you know, have you, have you prayed about it?" Well, he said, "Well, no." Um, he said, "Well." Um, when you came to this church, you know, you, you were sick. Your wife was sick. Your kids were sick. You spent all the, you, you didn't have much. He said, now look at you now. You're, you're, you live healthy. Your wife lives healthy. Your kids stay well. Um, you, you're, you're making more money than you made before. Um, you know, you got good, he started listing off all the things that happened to him in that church. And um, the guy was going to take it for like $50 a, a week more. And he got the man stopped and started thinking about it and started thinking, you know what? It's not worth it to change jobs. Because he said, is there a good church there? Have you found a good? He said, well, no, there's not one there like, like this. You know? So you're going to move your family and take them out of a place. So that's why church comes before your job. That, that, that church can bring more blessing into your life than a little extra money can from the job. So we think, oh, I'm going to get paid more money. That's automatically God, not necessarily. Hello. And who knows? You may hate the job once you take it. But, you know, you need your church. So your job comes last. So um, we spent a lot more time on God this morning than I was planning on, which is fine. Um, so God, spouse, children, church, job. Let's keep those priorities straight. Keep them in the proper place. They are all priorities. Just need to be in the right place. Amen. Hallelujah. Next week, our you know, uh, like I said, unless something crazy happens, um, we will be in our new place next Sunday. Hallelujah. Ten thirty a.m. Glory to God. We will start. We're uh, uh, we're going to have a celebratory. Fifth Sunday move-in potluck dinner. Bring the best. Amen? Bring, bring it. I mean, you know, I know we got cooks in the church. Amen. And if you can't cook, Bojangles can. <coughs> All right? Glory to God. 
Hallelujah. And uh, we're looking forward to that time together. Don't forget Tuesday night prayer, Wednesday night midweek service, both virtual this week. We will be moving back to Wednesday night live and virtual, but live. Um, let's go ahead and receive today's offering. If you need an offering uh, envelope, uh, you'll just have to wait till next week. If you need um, to give through Cash App or PayPal, go ahead and get that ready. Glory to God. Jesus said that we're to give and it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men shall give it to our bosom. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so, Father, we pray over the people as they tithe and give offerings. We thank you. You open heaven's windows. You empty out on them blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In the name of Jesus, we decree it and declare it. Amen. And amen. Praise God. Sure love all of you. Um, so excited about seeing us together and worshiping together in our own place. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time here. Faith and Victory Church. Good day.